We are on uh, minor prophets with a major message, and we're looking at the last of the minor prophets, uh, that being uh, Malachi. Uh, not to be pronounced uh, Malachi. Uh, this is not an, an Italian prophet in any way. This is uh, Malachi, <laughs> uh, the Hebrew uh, uh, prophet. Uh, and the last one uh, in our uh, Old Testament. Now, uh, we're looking at the minor prophets uh, for a number of reasons, uh, but, but one of them is actually rather intriguing. Some of the minor prophets uh, actually uh, prophesied when God's people were getting back together. That is, after being away for a while. <laughs> that sounds like a circumstance rather similar to ours, uh, doesn't it? So being away for a while uh, because of uh, circumstances that we didn't see uh, coming, and now God's people are going to get back together again. So it's worth looking at some of these small little books in the back of the Old Testament, uh, especially when their uh, circumstances seem as if uh, they overlap. So I'm going to go uh, through a brief uh, introduction to the uh, Old Testament prophets uh, again, and then uh, then we'll specifically get to uh, uh, Malachi, no, uh, Malachi, uh, and then we'll have some time for uh, interaction uh, along the way. So uh, maybe I'll go for about five or seven minutes, and then we'll break, uh, have some time of discussion, and I'll keep going uh, in a similar pattern. So everybody can see the PowerPoint, correct? Oh, good, good. Jeff assures me that you can. Um, if you're looking at uh, the Old Testament, it breaks down into three divisions, particularly if uh, you're, you're uh, Hebrew. It's uh, the Torah, uh, then the Nevaim, and then the Kutavim. Uh, the Torah being the law, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, those are the first five big books of uh, the Old Testament. But then, uh, if you're looking at the Hebrew scripture, you get into the Nevaim, uh, which is uh, the prophets, and you'd have uh, uh, some larger books uh, that we consider now the major prophets, and then some smaller books, thinner books, that are called the minor prophets. And then if you look in the Hebrew Bible, once again, you'd come to the Kuthavim, which is the writings, so which you'd have books like First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. I mean, those are all those are all writings. Psalms would fit the, in there as well, as well as Proverbs. Now we have the Greek or uh, order of the Old Testament, so uh, rather than the Hebrew one, and you'll see that from the picture on the right. Uh, my guess is a number of you have seen uh, the picture on the right, uh, either through Sunday school or through uh, our Wednesday lunchtime studies, as I've handed this out several times. Uh, looking at the books there on the upper left, the law, then uh, the historical writings, uh, which would have been the Kuthavim, uh, considered from the um, uh, Hebrew standpoint. Then the poetic writings in the red, uh, the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and such, also writings. And then the green books and the blue books are the major prophets and the minor prophets. Major prophets uh, are largely considered major because there's more of them. Uh, when you have 66 chapters of Isaiah, well, that's rather major, as opposed to, let's say, Obadiah, where you only have one chapter, well, that's rather minor. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to do with the importance uh, uh, of them. It's just uh, the uh, length of material. Although some of you probably would say, well, Isaiah is uh, quite strong. And indeed, he is uh, uh, definitely major in his uh, thinking and major in his length. Now, when you read Old Testament prophecy, you don't read this like anything that uh, we generally uh, read today. Um, it's not a, a biography, it's not a novel, it's not a history book. Um, it's actually a little bit difficult to, to read uh, because it's a prophetic writing, but we can handle it if we break it down a little bit. Try and look for images, because the, the prophets are just filled with great images uh, uh, for us to uh, ruminate on, like uh, the Lord coming to us like the spring rain, as uh, Hosea talks about. Isn't that a lovely image, uh, especially if you're in a desert climate, and all of a sudden along comes the rain. Um, uh, that's a great image, and that's found in the, um, uh, in the uh, prophetic uh, uh, books. Remember that uh, prophecy always corresponds uh, two ways. It corresponds looking back to the, the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, uh, Deuteronomy, and it also corresponds looking forwards to the time of the New Testament. So that can be a help too. And then we'll try and place it in time with the uh, kings and the rulers of the day, which will be an aid as well. But we can do that. 
Don't worry, that might seem like a lot, but, but we can do that, even in a study like this. Just in general, the minor, minor prophets tucked in the back of the New Testament, frequently not considered some great uh, poetic gems, and they do have a number of very powerful words for us today, including the book of Malachi, to which we're going to look at now. Any comments so far on, uh, on uh, reading the prophets? Before uh, going on to talk about who Malachi was and uh, or who we think he was, and then uh, a little bit of background before reading uh, the book of Malachi. Why were they relegated to the back of the Bible? <laughs> yeah, well, it's the Greeks uh, in the writings of the Septuagint placed them in the in the back of the Bible. It might simply be, uh, I mean, back of the Old Testament. It might just simply be because they're thin and they're small. That's that's my only understanding of it. Were they discovered later than some of them? No, no, they've been around. No, I mean they are generally dated later, but you know, Chronicles is actually dated later than the prophets, uh, the, some of the minor prophets. So, so it's not all by date. Let's talk about Malachi, the very last book in the Old Testament. Let's talk about who the prophet Malachi was and the time period in which he writes. Who is this man named Malachi? Well, his name means my messenger. And I've uh, actually given you a Hebrew word up there. You can see it on the left, and it looks like all sorts of funny squiggly lines, uh, but that's, uh, that's Hebrew. You read Hebrew from right to left. Um, I don't know if any of you have read, uh, written uh, or read uh, right to left, uh, but uh, that's what you do with uh, Hebrew. Uh, the first uh, uh, letter is actually an M, if you're on the far right. And then the next letter, if you go over, is a Lamed. Uh, that's a, uh, an L sound. Then the X there uh, is unpronounced. Uh, that's an Aleph. And then the next one after that is a K. So uh, the Hebrew gives you the consonants up top, and then underneath uh, you'll see the vowels. So... Um, Malak, uh, that's where you get Malak uh, from Malachi, and then the little, uh, looks like a little quote line at the end, uh, and that's uh, the uh, vowel uh, I, so it's Malaki, uh, which uh, that key there at the end, that tells you it's my, and Malak, uh, that tells you it's the word messenger. We don't know too much about this man, other than uh, he's my messenger, the messenger uh, who, um, uh, was uh, speaking at the time after the exile. Now, that's important. He's after the exile. He's in post-exilic Judah. Hmm. Bear with me for a little bit as we talk about Israel and Judah. There was, used to be one kingdom uh, under uh, King David uh, where Israel and Judah were merged together. Then uh, following David, he had his son uh, named Solomon, who had a very large kingdom. But then there were two brothers afterwards that split, and there's a Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and they split, forming Israel and then Judah. So Israel's the northern kingdom, uh, and then Judah, the southern kingdom. Both go into exile, meaning both were taken over by uh, foreign nations. Uh, Israel went into exile first, 722 BC, and that was uh, through the king of Assyria. And then 586 BC, Judah is taken away uh, by Babylon. And you probably remember some of the Babylonian kings. The most uh, notorious is King Nebuchadnezzar. Perhaps you can uh, uh, remember his name. Spelling it's a little bit more difficult, but uh, anyway, that's uh, uh, the most notorious of um uh, uh, noteworthy of the Babylonian kings. He's writing after the exile. So the Hebrews are now coming back after being in Babylon for, for a number of years. Remember that the exile was a, it's an awful condition. Uh, the law talked about going into exile would be a terrible thing. So uh, this is recovery time for the Israelites. And there's a temple that's rebuilt. You can see the picture of that temple on the right. Um, about 65 years after uh, coming back, they rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. 
So they're trying to recover, and it's in this time that Malachi is prophesying, and he likely knew Ezra, uh, who is uh, from uh, the book of Ezra uh, in the Old Testament, and Ezra is an important person for bringing God's people back together. Who's ruling? Remember how we said the uh, prophets, uh, we ought to try and place them in conjunction with who is ruling at the time? Well, it's not the Jewish kings, uh, because Israel, or I'm sorry, Judah is, has come back together and they're reformulating, uh, but it's the Persians that sort of have this area as being um, a subsidiary of their um, uh, government uh, in, um, uh, well, in Persia of the time. We can see even in Malachi chapter 1, verse 8, that there's a Persian governor who's, uh, who's there at the time. It's probably uh, just after the time of King uh, Darius, uh, who was uh, there uh, in Persia. A couple other things that we know are happening at the time. Uh, we know that uh, the uh, temple was starting to practice again as sacrifices were being reinstated. That was an important thing for the Jews. Intermarriage uh, with non-Jews was becoming commonplace. Uh, we read that from Malachi 2. Um, we know that uh, religious observances in the, uh, in the temple was lax at best. Not a good thing. We'll talk about that in a moment. Tithes are also down as well. So um, let's break it right there and see if anybody has a comment or a thought that they'd like to share. One question I have is, what was the, uh, under the Persian governor's uh, rule, um, typically when you had to compare to the Babylonians, it was more hands-off. Was that what they see from the evidence there? That uh, yeah. it wasn't, wasn't as heavy-handed? No, they're not as heavy-handed. They're, they're a little looser. Yep. But there's a, there's a governor who's there who reports uh, all the way to, uh, I'm not sure what the, the capital of the Persian Empire was, but it's uh, certainly east, east of uh, Judah at that time. If you have uh, your Old Testament uh, open uh, to Malachi, that's great, because uh, we're now going to start reading texts from Malachi and to, you know, thinking about uh, how they um, uh, might apply to today. So. So let's start right from the beginning in Malachi 1.1, 1, 1, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. And then we have this very important section. And we've got to recognize that Malachi 1.2 really frames the entire uh, book. I have loved you, says the Lord. I have loved you. How does this start? This whole prophecy starts with, I am devoted to you. Israel. And this is a promise that goes back a long, long ways. But now as uh, God's people are now reconstituting uh, themselves, coming back together, God once again speaks about how he has loved them. He called them out of, uh, uh, out of Egypt. He looked after them uh, through the reign of King David. And even in uh, the time of exile, even when they've gone their own way, he still loves them, and that's how this uh, entire book starts. It starts with God's love. The rest of verse 2. But you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob. Jacob, um, Jacob and Esau, of course, uh, from uh, 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 their father Isaac years ago, and Jacob being chosen for uh, the people uh, of God. I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. Now, if we were to dig around a little bit in the Hebrew here, we'd see that this is a covenant love. Um, this is not uh, just a, a feeling one has oh, for a girlfriend or in the time of spring. We're in the time of spring, right? probably remember uh, uh, younger uh, times are sort of feeling uh, spring is a time of love. This is deeper. And this is uh, that sense of covenant uh, commitment uh, between, uh, deep commitment between uh, husband and wife, in this case, between God the Father and his people. I have loved you. I've always loved you. I've always loved you. 
we had a little more time, we could go uh, trace this th theme, uh, which shows up uh, in the Old Testament, and runs all the way through the, the new. I will be your God, and you will be my people, and I will dwell in your midst. I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will dwell in your midst. That goes all the way back to the times uh, of Exodus. So this is the beginning backdrop. God is a God of love. He still cares very much, but we got some problems, all right? And that's what we're on to now. What are some of the problems? One of them is problem of, uh, of worship. Impure sacrifices and impure, impure sacrificers. Hmm, what do I mean? Malachi 1 verses six through eight. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? Favor, says the Lord of hosts. Hmm. What do we have here? God's people not showing honor and respect for the Lord. Um, if God's their father, where is his honor? Right? So, we honor our fathers. We respect them. In the very least, uh, we should respect them as uh, we come close to Father's Day, which uh, is just in a few weeks where we remember uh, particularly our fathers. But a father has a sense of uh, uh, responsibility of care for the family. And in the very least, uh, the heavenly father has the care for his people. So if he is uh, the father of God's people, then where is his honor? Where is his fear? And then we see how particularly it's been uh, affected and polluted uh, by offering polluted food upon the altar. Okay. Now, we might not think about that uh, as much uh, in uh, our day. We get uh, food uh, uh, in packages, and we have it frozen, and we don't see it uh, before it comes to us. Uh, but in that time, if you're offering a sacrifice uh, to the Lord, it's supposed to be a very clean uh, animal, not, not the leftover uh, or the one uh, that is, uh, is uh, mangled or blemished. Some of you may remember Exodus 12, verse 15. This is uh, from the Passover. Uh, uh, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, uh, but it's supposed to be an unblemished, spotless lamb. Okay. This uh, just a representative of a number of times where the sacrifice is supposed to be, it's supposed to be clean. I'm reading on a little bit further now in Malachi with that problem. And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to, to us. With such a gift from our hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an, a, an offering from your hand." Not to give the, the leftovers, not to give the impure things to the Lord. Um, he's expecting that um, if he is their father, legitimately, which he is, that he would receive something that's worthy of him being the father, right? So that's a problem. So just summarizing so far, God is their father. He is the loving father of the people of Judah. He's their master. He's their kind master from years and years ago. He is their great king, yet by their actions, offering uh, half-done sacrifices, they disregard these, uh, these truths. Hmm. Maybe somebody has a comment or a thought on Malachi chapter 1 at this point. When <clears throat> he says, I hated Esau, um, yeah. that's pretty strong. I'm surprised about that. That is very strong, isn't it? Uh, and why would why was that? Because of the sacrifices? Uh, okay, we have to go back in time to, to Genesis, where uh, Esau traded in uh, his birthright uh, for a bowl of right. stew. Um, right. 
and then the question is, uh, you know, how did this all come come about? But uh, you know, Esau acted recklessly at 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 that time, and and that now continues on, even as we see here in the time of Malachi. Purity and sacrifice is really strong theme uh, within the Old Testament. I'm going to still hold on to this last slide. Who's doing such things, offering these impure sacrifices? It's actually the priests. The problem is with the priests. They're putting the wrong things on the altar, and that's pushing God's people away. That was a problem then, and now I'm going to bridge to, is it a problem now? I'd say, yes, it is. Um, and as we think about reconstituting as a, as a people of God, um, you know, those uh, in uh, the places of, of, uh, of, of pastoral authority or, or the priesthood, we need to be very careful here. Um, you know, if we're going to be witnessing to the Lord, uh, there ought to be a certain uh, a sense of, uh, of, um, of right conduct that, that's expected uh, from, um, uh, from those who are serving uh, in, um, in pastoral capacity. I'm going to uh, uh, point us to a few modern problems right now. I'm sure you uh, uh, may have some feelings about this. Um, while I was serving overseas, uh, we uh, were dealing with uh, the church sex abuse scandal, which was great uh, in Europe, particularly in um, Belgium, uh, was um, uh, the worst, um, uh, some of the worst occurrences where the uh, Bishop of Bruges had uh, resigned for sexually abusing boy, uh, a boy for years. Probes uh, were found in 300 abuses within the Belgian Catholic churches, uh, leading to several of the alleged victims uh, committing suicide. Uh, this had affected uh, all of the, of the uh, districts, the major districts of the Catholic Church in Belgium. And it was a real blight uh, on the church, and it's no wonder that uh, there are one uh, percent or less, one uh, percent or fewer attending church in Belgium uh, to this day. You know that these things have uh, 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 spread out, and uh, there have been other abuses in Ireland, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Austria, Switzerland, Malta, Spain, Australia, and the USA. Um, working with some stats that are a little bit old, they've only increased but uh, 4,444 um, uh, were abused by Catholic priests within the Australian Catholic Church over the past 35 years. And Cardinal George Pell was charged with multiple sexual assaults, uh, and he was also a top financial advisor for the Pope. Um, I've gone on a, a record on this on uh, Centrally uh, Speaking, saying that uh, we need to uh, clean some of this, uh, this up within the broader church, but it's very difficult to, for the church to worship when those uh, who are placed uh, in a spot of authority uh, are uh, not behaving uh, uh, properly, particularly in this area. I'll give a few more stats. Um, this is from a Pew Research uh, Center um, uh, report. And I, I should say that uh, it's, the problem is not simply limited to the Catholic Church, but extends uh, further. There are a vast majority of um, US adults who have heard about uh, problems with sexual abuse in the church. Um, and with roughly 48% think that abuse is more common in the Catholic Church than in other religious groups, but a similar share, 47%, say sexual abuse and misconduct is just as common among clergy and other religious traditions as it is among Catholic priests uh, and bishops. It is a problem. It is a problem that we need to clean up uh, within the church. And I'm uh, speaking here as somebody in the clergy. Uh, I hope you will keep us as clergy uh, accountable in these in, in every way. Comment or thoughts on this. Um, you know, it's a problem in Malachi's time when the priests are uh, misbehaving uh, and it's obvious and clear uh, about their misbehavior. Uh, it's a problem now when there is misbehavior as well. I'm just pointing at uh, sexual misconduct uh, as an example today. Comment or thought from you? Well, I don't know the details, but I heard just, just recently Either a cardinal or an archbishop in uh, Poland was uh, decrying again the the problem of uh, abuse in the uh, Catholic Church, and when you look at the common and see the the forty seven percent equally common, what what people you know 
think about the Catholic Church, it's, it's since its hierarchical structure, as opposed to a congregational independent, they have more of a of a ability or to, for the reporting. But like I say, it's just as believable that it's there, but just not reported yeah. or recorded. Uh, recording and reporting is is difficult in these things, but uh, yes. Yes, it very well may be much more than the stats I've given today. Okay, let's go back to uh, Malachi, and we'll go back to some slides here. Are we good? Okay, good. Hmm, here's another problem. Problems with intermarriage and divorce. Malachi 2, 10 through 16. What does he write there? Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. Hmm. I'm going to read a little bit further in a moment, but uh, uh, note how we go back to the image of the father, right? We started that in Malachi 1, right? Uh, the loving father. Don't we all have one father? Yes, the answer would be, has not one God created us? Yes, we would be. Then why are we faithless to one another, pro profaning the covenant of our fathers? Um, faithfulness, uh, a characteristic that uh, uh, Malachi uh, uh, picks up with God's people uh, years ago. Very, very important to be faithful. When we say yes, we should follow through. You know, when we say no, we should follow through particularly in this case, when it comes to our relationship with the Lord and when it comes to the relationship with one and another. This has been a favorite uh, text for those uh, wanting to encourage uh, marriage to one, um, from one man to one woman um, and uh, having it be for life. Uh, Malachi definitely picks up these ideas. We keep reading. And the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Hmm. A couple things here, right? The Lord was witness at the marriage ceremony. He was witness when you said yes to the wife of your youth. And when you proclaim that you would be faithful. All right, we were just uh, on faithfulness and covenant when we make these agreements one with another. We should follow through. We keep reading. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Be faithful instead. Well, we have a problem with that in our day and age. Um, I'm sure I don't need to uh, remind you of uh, marriage uh, statistics uh, uh, and how, uh, they, uh, how many are choosing to opt out of marriage. Um, but when we say we're going to be faithful, we should follow through. And Malachi picks that up with God's people years ago. I think the Lord would be picking that up with us today as well, to be faithful, to follow through as to what we're going to, as to what we say, as to what we do. Is anybody gonna uh, have a comment that they wanna make there? Well, don't, don't you think technology has added to that whole uh, ability of someone to move on to another person or another relationship. It just makes it so much easier, I, I would guess, from uh, the viewpoint of back in the Old Testament, it wasn't that easy. It, yeah. you, you, but now today, it's that easy. You have dating sites and all this other stuff out there that you can get involved in, and uh, it's just too easy. Yes. Yes, it certainly has well, even gotten easier. I'm, yeah, like Lois, like Lois said, I'm not speaking personally. <laughs> uh, this is this is the devil talking here. It isn't me. Devil's advocate. 
<laughs> well, something like that. But but I agree with you, Jim. I, I think I think it is easier. My kids the other night at the table uh, told my wife and I that there is a, a, a site for having um, uh, online affairs, specifically oh, wow. for having online affairs. Uh, huh. um, I haven't checked it out. <laughs> I'm not going to check it out, but uh, I didn't grow up with that. Um, and our, our youth are growing up with that. So, so yeah, technology can make it easier for that. I'm, I'm sorry that, uh, that the world has changed in these ways. I think with the uh, technology, it just magnifies the ability for, you look at it in uh, with the larger urban areas and all, for anonymity. It's harder when you're in a small village in the desert to be, you know, in secret. Whereas when you get larger and larger um, cities and groups together and where people don't know each other, um, that type of behavior can go through because who knows? You know, it's it's that a lack of, uh, of people knowing each other that leads to uh, some of the problems. Well, I think technology is a double-edged sword because we have this Bible study and your messages online. Yeah. So it's a personal thing and your faith, um, how you live and what you access. Yeah, it is. Perhaps it's more complicated having these other options. Um, but at the end of the day, it's it's the heart, isn't it, Joyce, as you were saying? Wouldn't you agree? Yes, it's just, uh, you know, there are a lot of temptations out there. And so you just have to be faithful and ask the Lord to help you be faithful. Yes. Well, let's keep going on here. Uh, Malachi is really saying a mouthful here, isn't he, when we start uh, making these uh, uh, parallels to today. Uh, problems with the priests, uh, problems with uh, faithfulness. Let's pick up another one. Uh, problems with justice hmm. and patience. Math Malachi 2, 17 through 3, 6. We're just, in, due to time, we're only going to focus on one verse, but uh, uh, this is rather thought-provoking where we read, you have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Hmm. Everyone who does evil is good. We're having a problem with that in society today, aren't we? Right? Good being proclaimed to be evil and evil being proclaimed to be good. And it wearies our Lord. David McKinley and I were fortunate to uh, study under uh, a man named David Wells. Uh, Dr. David Wells uh, uh, was a, a scholar at Gordon-Conwell uh, Seminary, uh, wrote a number of books uh, uh, analyzing culture. Uh, these were two of uh, his, uh, his best. Uh, no Place for, tr for Truth, or Whatever Happened to Evangelical Theology, but the real point is, Whatever Happened to Truth? Uh, where has truth gone? And then the other one, losing our virtue. Why the church must recover its uh, moral vision. Yes. Uh, well, this is what he said. I think it's a very uh, uh, thought-provoking quote. What is striking about our situation today is that for so many people, there is nothing out there that can legitimately uh, validate any action or belief. There is simply nothing there that makes anything right. Or to put it differently, we are building a brilliant and complex civilization, but it all rests on a vacuum. This does not mean, of course, that it is now impossible for the state to make laws, rules, and regulations. To the contrary, we are now drowning in them. But what this vacuum means is that, there is, that nothing in life ever has any ultimate authorization. It has not always been like this. Beneath other civilizations, and even in our past, it was believed that there was an authority in life. And this, of course, is at the heart of Christian faith. It is God who supremely validates beliefs and the use of power, or he does not do so. This is where the line between good and evil lies. But good and evil are now abstractions in our contemporary world. They have become irrelevant to the living of life. Okay. I think Wells is, uh, has picked up on something there, and that's a picture of David Wells in the chapel there at Gordon-Conwell. Uh, but maybe you have some thoughts on uh, good and evil being blurred, and, or maybe uh, Dr. David Wells' uh, uh, thoughts. I think that's very accurate because 
it, it happens all the time. You, you, and we have an opportunity to view it on TV, uh, the internet, and, and other, other ways that it's actually, we are going through this effort. And, um, you know, they did, back, back in the uh, Old Testament, they didn't have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But we can, we can develop what's good, what we think is good, and somebody else can develop what they think is good or, and or bad. And uh, it's just, there's no, there's no real standard for yeah. either one. When you look at the uh, situation in uh, any of the authoritarian regimes, whether the, the former uh, USSR or China or fascist regimes like you had in, uh, in Germany and Italy, you know, there is no underpinning. And you get to a situation where we, we do it because we can when it comes down to law. There's no basis as, as, as well as we alluding to for a moral compass. It's, it's strictly power and making man the authority. Mm -hmm. So we end up with laws, but not necessarily a foundation of laws. It's a problem. Well, the reason is there's so many laws is because there is no foundation. And that, that's the whole thing. So, you know, when somebody makes a law, it becomes the law, but, it, but it, it becomes the law because there is no foundation. Yep. It doesn't go back to a foundation. It doesn't go back and you don't have a litmus test or something that says, is this a good one or a bad one? Or is this going to be, you know, um, inherent to what we're going to do and what we were told we were supposed to do. Why don't we move on to the, the next uh, thing is Malachi keeps uh, giving us a mouthful uh, of things to uh, consider in this small little book at the end of the Old Testament. There's a problem with tithes and offerings, Malachi 3, verses 7 through 12, where we read these words. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? And then um, Malachi picks up uh, how they are robbing from the Lord. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with, uh, with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you, and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Okay. Well, not enough uh, uh, support for uh, God's uh, temple then. Say probably today too, broadly speaking, uh, uh, there's uh, less support for the church of God than what it should be. As frequently, the tithe has a way of showing where the heart is. Um, uh, giving in uh, several sectors of uh, uh, of uh, Western life is is small, much smaller than what it uh, what it should be. And I leave, of course, as a pastor, we leave these things uh, uh, up to your heart and uh, your um, uh, inc inclination is uh, how you feel before the Lord. But uh, at the end of the day, it's um, what should be given to the Lord should be given uh, uh, to the Lord, uh, and not. Um, uh, squirrel away as if uh, he doesn't exist uh, at all. Anybody want to make a comment on that? Well, I think I think that all uh, goes into the same situation. You have a lot of nowadays. You have a lot of single parents, some working uh, multiple jobs, and uh, a the children at home don't get that foundation mm -hmm. um, that they used to get when we were probably kids and um, in and out of relationships um, is such a disruptive character to it so that uh, kids have to move forward on their own rather than with their parents because they're sometimes the parents aren't there and i think that not having the foundation of parents and seeing how that all plays out I, I believe has a big impact on our society today and what one person thinks and therefore what one person thinks is right uh, isn't right for another person mm -hmm. and family because there is no foundation 
at, at the family level. Mm -hmm. The structure of family and society, very important. Uh, uh, Malachi doesn't uh, uh, directly uh, deal with that, but that is so important for um, uh, the foundations of morality and, and care uh, and, and love, isn't it? It's interesting. We always think of tithing as money. Yeah. But here they're talking about food as well. Yep. Um, just considering the concept of what would happen if we tithed with food. Yep. In addition to money, maybe. Where would that food go? How should we distribute yep. it? I mean, just a thought. That's a, it, that's a good thought. And, and maybe you, you're going down this road, Jeff, of um, other things can be given, even beside, let's say, the dollar bill. Um, but, you know, whether it's service or whether it's uh, um, uh, helps uh, in some ways, uh, you know, give the Lord his, his, his portion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just a couple more slides before we finish up here. Yeah, Malachi ends in the similar way to um, uh, the way it begins, with God's love for the remnant people that are coming back uh, uh, to him in Judah and even in today. Think of these verses now from Malachi chapter 3. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. Right? That's, that's a good thing. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make, make up my treasured possess, possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Now, this uh, picture off to the right, uh, they shall be mine. Uh, this uh, one, uh, the picture uh, even says that they will um, and openly declare them to be my jewels. Uh, that's a nice picture, isn't it? Uh, 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 a way to show off the glory and the splendor of the Lord. Uh, those whose hearts are fully devoted to him, uh, who have their hearts in the, in the place where uh, they're, they're following his words, uh, where they're uh, offering things to him, where they're faithful, uh, this shows off the Lord very well indeed. But then it comes with uh, one final um, uh, uh, point about how the Lord will come again. Uh, because Malachi chapter 4, uh, the last chapter in the Old Testament, speaks about the Lord's second coming. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evil do evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. Probably a messianic reference there. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You should go out leaping like calves from the stall. It's an interesting image, isn't it? It's only the minor prophets that give us something like this. Calves leaping from the stall like newborns, right? And you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Good. Let's uh, bring this in for conclusion with a command and a promise. Malachi 4, verses 4 through 6. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at, at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Remember the law, come back to, uh, come back to him, remember the statutes. Uh, Horeb, a reference uh, to um, uh, the, the, the Ten Commandments uh, there. And behold, I will send a prophet before you, Elijah being one of the greatest before the day of the Lord comes. So, bridging now to uh, modern times. Returning shortly, yes. Uh, we're already starting to talk about that, coming back together again. Uh, we don't know when the governor is going to uh, uh, lift uh, uh, the uh, uh, designation of being uh, in red to being yellow or into green, uh, uh, but we're talking about that here at the church. 
Um, but there's something greater going on. If we think about uh, Malachi and how the people returned years ago, uh, let's start with the great premise that God loves us. He's always loved us. He's always loved us. He sent his son to die for us. And even though we've gone through this time, he still cares for us and he wants to bring us back. He's invested in us. He is interested in us. And what he really wants more than us showing up in this building, although I look forward to us all showing up in this building again, uh, again he wants our hearts. He wants us to express fear and honor to him. Fear him, honor him. First importance, to stay true to the Ten Commandments as best as we know how. To have uh, pure Christian workers uh, whose hearts are in it and fully devoted to him. And then also to express our honor by giving, whether it be of food, uh, symbolic for uh, gifts of service, or whether it be of money, but to be uh, giving the full share and an unblemished share to him. We're going to return, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we will return to this building uh, in the near future. But ultimately, uh, our Lord will come again and he will return and our hearts should be prepared in the very same way, knowing that he loves us, knowing that we should honor him, that we should give of our best to him, that we should uh, follow in line of the ten, ten Commandments to honor and fear the Lord. So Malachi, even though it's stuck at the end of the Old Testament, a small, tiny little book, here is a minor prophet, I think has a major message for today. Final comments and thoughts, anyone? When you look at uh, the Malachi's description of the behavior of the priests, it, when you flash forward, I guess, 400 years past the uh, uh, intertestamental period, and you see then what's happened with the money changers yes. and uh, in the temple, yes. you see that this was not something that just sprang out of nowhere. You had a period of over, I guess, over 400 years. And when you look at the writings in the non-canonical uh, texts like the Maccabees, you can see how, <laughs> obviously they didn't listen to Malachi and things got worse. Yeah. Yes, uh, precisely. Uh, precisely, they did not, and then they should have. All right, should we close with a word of prayer? Why don't we do that? Heavenly Father, thank you for this uh, small little book in the back of the Old Testament. We thank you for Malachi, his faithfulness. Uh, we pray that uh, you would help us to be faithful too. Help us to follow through on our word when we give it. Help us to follow in the ways of uh, uh, the Ten Commandments. Help us to honor and love you. And we pray, Lord, that as uh, we uh, think of returning, that uh, we would also uh, remember that uh, you love us and love us dearly and want our best and that uh, these uh, uh, commands uh, provide a, a means for our hearts to be open, to love you and serve you better. So help us uh, today, Lord, and bless each one who's gathered today. Strengthen us and uh, uh, encourage us uh, as we continue to walk uh, during uh, this time uh, of lockdown. We pray this today in Christ's name. Amen.